Pasniga from Devon is Sylvester, England. Tak for that, Yag Fikoma Hitidag. We have Google Translate to thank for that. Uh, but unfortunately for you, and I have to make my apologies, that is the full extent of my Swedish, okay? So from here on in, it's, it's in English. Um, I thought you'd like to know where I came from. Um, I don't know how much you know about our country, but Devon is a... I've got a pointer here. Devon is this little spot down here in the southwest. We too have weather like this uh, a lot, um, a lot of rain. Um, so, greetings from, from Devon. Um, I, am, I am biased, but um, I would say that Devon is one of the most beautiful parts of England, um, and it's a place full of natural and cultural heritage. Uh, this is um, a place called Dartmoor, uh, and this is just uh, literally near our office, our head office in, in Devon. Uh, and uh, you have skiing, we have surfing. Uh, that's me. No, it's, it's not. I, I wish it was, but um, so there we are. So what, what brings me here today? Um, well, I've got a rather convoluted sort of title, um, an integrated approach to planning and designing innovative and accessible interpretation for natural and cultural heritage sites. Take a breath. OK. Um, before I go any further, I perhaps should explain a little bit about um, myself and image makers. Um, my background is in countryside recreation and conservation, um, but I've been working with image makers now for 13 years, um, where I specialise in interpretive planning um, and also creative copywriting. Um, image makers is a close knit team, and we have a sort of multidisciplinary team of about 12 people, and it incorporates uh, all forms of design. Um, planning, copywriting, but our backgrounds vary. We're not all graduates of interpretation studies. We come from educational psychology, museum studies, uh, as I said, conservation and countryside management, uh, graphic design, and advertising and marketing. Um, and it was very much the vision of Jane, who's our, our director, to pull together this diverse group of people. Um, and it, we've because of this breadth of background, we've been able to get involved in a huge variety of different projects. And I think, um, certainly talking to Pear before this event, um, it seems that this kind of, our kind of organisation is a little bit unusual in Sweden, is that fair to say? Having all of the disciplines kind of within a team. Um, but actually in England it's quite common, um, and you might we, we sort of might refer to it as a one-stop shop. Does that translate, the idea that you just go... So from the creative spark and the con concepts through to the end delivery, we work with our clients. That's enough about image makers, but I thought it's useful for you to understand uh, where I'm coming from. Um, OK, oh, what's, what's happened there? Thank you, Victor. Back to the Future. No, I'm not going to talk about my favourite film. Um, how many people have seen Back to the Future? Just a... <laughs> Good, OK. Uh, I just wanted to pause before I sort of launch into things. Um, this is a way of looking back. Um, and last night we were talking about how many people here would know, if I said Tilden's Principles of Interpretation, how many people would know? P could, could I have a show of hands as to what, whether that means Tilden, Freeman Tilden's Principles of Interpretation? OK, interesting. Come and see me afterwards if you want uh, a bit more on this. But um, we, in interpretation, we, we can sum up the principles really in three words. Provoke, relate, and reveal. And that is the process of interpretation, to, to provoke people into thinking in new ways, to make sure that we relate the message to, to the experience of the audience, and then ultimately to reveal new truths or new things about the environment, the world around people uh, that perhaps they hadn't realised or thought about before. And I'd like to suggest that those principles are as relevant and as alive as they ever have been. Um, but whilst those principles have remained largely unchanged, um, the means by which we can engage with audiences clearly hasn't stayed the same uh, since the 1950s. And unless we've had our head buried deep in the sand or in the water, we'll know that technology has transformed the way that we can um, 
talk to people and communicate uh, messages. So over the next few slides, I'd like to share with you a few examples of how uh, technology can be a great tool. And I'm sure there'll be crossover with things that uh, are talked about later on as well. Um, but before I launch off, I just want to explain a little bit about our approach to interpretation, and particularly um, when it comes to sort of our, our approach to planning and design. Um, and I just want to show a, a short film, from a, 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 which is actually of another of my favourite films. Hopefully you'll be able to make sense of it. Yes, with being great technology, uh, it didn't work within the PowerPoint. We have to launch it separately, so <laughs> apologies. For your information, there's a lot more to ogres than people think. Example? Example? Okay, um... Ogres are like onions. They stink? Yes. No. Oh, they make you cry? No! Oh, you leave them out in the sun, they get all brown, start sprouting little white hairs. No! Layers! Onions have layers. Ogres have layers. Onions have layers? You get it. We both have layers. <sighs> Oh, you both have layers. Oh. You know, not everybody likes onions. <laughs> I don't know how much of that came across with the American, fast-moving American accents. Um, layering. Like an onion has layers. We, we talk about layering in our approach to interpretation, and this is very important. Now, layering can work at different scales. So take... For ex Does anyone know this concept as a matter of interest? Layering? Yeah? I'm getting quite a few nods. No. Okay. So if, when, when we're designing, for example, uh, at the smaller scale, an in a single interpretation board, uh, we might make sure in the design that we have a catchy, thought-provoking title, and then a very brief introductory paragraph that encapsulates the message. And then further, if people are interested, they move to the next layer down and they can find out more about the story. And there might be pictures with captions, because people like to, some people like myself, prefer looking at pictures with captions than reading lots of text. So at one level, it works like that. But also, we can apply it, and we should apply it, on a whole site basis or a whole exhibition basis, so that we help meet the different motivations, the different needs and aspirations of our visitors. So very much this is about an audience-led approach to interpretation. So um, fundamentally, it's about provoke, relate, reveal, meeting the needs of, of our audiences. And it might sound quite obvious, but sometimes, and this is maybe a little word of warning, um, sometimes in the excitement around new technologies, um, we can sometimes rush to use technologies without really thinking properly and fully about our interpretive goals and about the visitor experience as a whole. And obviously there are great opportunities in technology, but, and, and we'll see some in a minute, but you know, to be truly integrated approach, we need, to, we need to maybe not forget the low tech alongside the high tech and look at ways in which we can use them in combination. So I just wanted to start with that, that thought. I seem to have got a lot of film and television references. OK. Do you all recognize that, the program? OK. The X Factor. And basically, for those of you who don't know it, it's a talent competition to find the best singer, the person who has the X Factor. Um, and so before I want to look at some case studies, um, I'd like to explore the X Factor in interpretation, or one of the X Factors in interpretation, that has a, an important role alongside layering in our approach to interpretation. Um, when we design and plan a particular piece of interpretation, we, all of us, and I'm not just talking about us, but we should expend a great deal of effort researching and planning the messages that we want to convey. That, if you like, is the, the part on the left of the equation, the message. <coughs> and it's rightly so, and I, I personally take a lot of pride in writing messages and copy and getting it just right for, for visitors. We also spend time carefully considering the different media, and we're going to hear about lots of these today, um, be it signage, leaflets, audio guides, smartphone apps, the list is very long. Thus, we have a simple formula in a, in a sense that message plus media equals the spark of meaning in our visitor, the goal that we want to achieve. 
But I'd like to suggest that's not always the case. Oops. Take this piece of interpretation. This is in the Science Museum in London. Um, it's a cleverly projected globe, and its intention is to convey something of how energy is used um, across the world. And it does that by uh, indicating circles of varying size. Now, a colleague of mine visited the uh, Science Museum in London and took this photo. And he just thought, as a sort of very non-scientific experiment, thought he would just listen in on people's conversations to hear what they were saying in response to this piece of interpretation. They were saying things like this. Wow, I want one of those in my bedroom. <laughs> I wonder how they projected that onto a globe. Gosh, how much did that cost? OK, so comments like that might suggest that uh, the equation that I showed you before, message plus media equals meaning, isn't necessarily working. It seems that, you know, in spite of the clever and eye-catching technology, some of the visitors, at least on that visit, were not really getting the message at all. So what's, what's going on? Could there be something missing? There we are. What's the missing X factor, if you like? I just want to look briefly at an example um, now, um, it's not admittedly from the world of interpretation. Actually, it's an experiment that took place in Stockholm uh, with the intention um, of... Oops, there we go. No, I'll go back. With the intention of trying to motivate people to use stairs instead of escalators. Now, I saw a nod going on, <laughs> or two going on here. OK, so some of you... OK, be quiet, you people who know. How would you go about motivating someone to use uh, the stairs rather than the escalator? Any ideas? Just as a thought. Yeah? I would make it like a piano. <laughs> would you now? Interesting. <laughs> right, OK, I'm not going to play that game. Let's just watch a little um, video if we can. Um, I just want to show you that, yeah. yeah. So fun. Fun is, is obviously uh, one motivating factor by which we can persuade people to do things, as in this experiment. But it's, it's not the only one. And um, there we are. Motivation. That, I believe, is a very important thing to consider uh, in our interpretation. And there we are. I should skip through. We've seen that. So fun's one motivating factor. Um, but actually, there are many other forms of motivation um, and motivational techniques that we can look to. If I asked you, for example, um, to donate uh, 400 Swedish kroner a month to the Matt Jones Lager Fund, okay, um, 
Or if I say, say if that was one way I put it. And if I if if then said, well, actually, for less than the cost of a cup of coffee a day, you can donate to the Matt Jones Lager Fund. The way that we frame a question could influence, can influence very strongly how people react. The, the point of that is you wouldn't give me any money for my lager fund, obviously, but for a worthy cause, you might be more inclined to give if it was framed as less, it'll cost you less than a cup of coffee a day rather than giving you a hard figure. So framing is one motivational technique. Limited duration, well, we see this all around us all the time. Uh, you know, limited offer, uh, today only, the shops are full of sales and, you know, limited time offers. And the, the research shows that uh, if there's a choice between action and inaction, and you introduce a limited time duration into the equation, people are more likely to act. So that's uh, another technique. Humour, I think we are all... Um, I, we were discussing humour last night, and I think we've concluded that the Swedish and the British have quite a similar sense of humour. Uh, Monty Python, uh, yeah, um, and you, yeah, so anyway. <laughs> humour humor crosses, uh, crosses borders, definitely. And here are um, a further three techniques. Collecting. Um, I mean, it starts when we're young, as children. For some of us, it never stops. Uh, but the research shows that people like to add to and complete sets of things. They like to collect, in other words. <coughs> Status. Uh, right from, again, an early age, it's this irresistible urge to um, want to do better than our peers and to compare ourselves with, uh, with, with each other. Challenge. Most of us relish a challenge. As long the challenge isn't too complex or boring. Somewhere in the middle, we all like challenges. And in short, we think there's a word that sums up a lot of this sort of motivational language, and that is gaming. Okay. Now, I know what some of you might think when you hear the word gaming and you think of gamers. You might think of someone like this. Okay. Um, but actually, um, the truth is, Gaming is huge business, and it's huge business for a reason, because it works. <laughs> um, here's just a few statistics from, from the UK. Sorry, I couldn't get any for Sweden, but you, know, you may find that they're very similar. More than 10 million people in the UK, well, the, the figure of 10 million might not, because you only have 9 million people, but <laughs> percentage-wise. More than 10 million people in the UK spend at least 20 hours a week playing games. In a country with a strong gaming culture, the average young person will spend 10,000 hours playing games before they're 21. And in, in the UK, at least, the games industry is, is bigger than the pop industry. So, you know, there's a, a, a very serious thing that, that we're on to here. Um, whoops, no, let me just uh, find my place. So, actually, and it's not always the big showy... 3D graphic games. It's actually the, the most staggering growth has been in the quick, fun little challenges and games. And you know, you, you look at uh, Facebook, you look at places like Foursquare and Scavenger, a lot of social media networks. They utilize gaming to keep people hooked and keep them on the network. So I just want an honest appraisal here, because I don't think this is all just about young people either. Okay? So how many how many of you play games at some point on your Devices. Now, I want you to be honest here. Okay. What's that? 50, 40, 50%? Okay. So, it, it, this isn't just about young people, in fact. Um, so, the, the, the question is, how, how can these motivating factors and the idea of gaming help us to create innovative and accessible interpretation? And I'd like to share some uh, examples with you. Um, firstly, um, a project called the Chester Portico project. Now, Chester is a historic walled city in the north of England. It's very beautiful. It's a very major tourist attraction. Um, and this project involved a partnership with um, historic cities in Europe, Cologne in Germany, Ghent in Belgium, Utrecht in the Netherlands. And the idea was to demonstrate best practice in the use of archaeology um, for tourism and economic development. And the experience from Chester and the other cities will be used to help cities across Europe protect and use their archaeological heritage for economic benefit. Now, I, I know that we're mostly talking about nature interpretation today, but I believe that a lot of the techniques and the things that I'm talking about are transferable across heritage as a whole. So, you know, bear, bear with me, please. Um, so I'd just like to just uh, briefly 
um, t show you a video. Um, we were involved in the outset from, with planning and implementing a scheme which involved on-site interpretation panels, way more public art, literature, and a comprehensive Walls Quest um, smartphone app, which we produced for Android and, and, and Apple iPhone um, and, and devices. Now, the Walls Quest app incorporates a number of motivational gaming elements, collecting, collecting challenges, and status-related features, such as an online uh, leader's scoreboard to show levels of attainment, so you can play a game. But I'll just let, if we watch the video briefly, um, it'll give you a sense of what the app is about. The city walls are such a great way of exploring the whole of Chester. You won't miss a thing. And now you can experience the walls in an entirely new way with the Walls Quest app. Hidden in the stones of the city walls are stories and legends that help reveal the last 2,000 years of life in the city. Walls Quest is your key to unlocking these stories. You'll see the city through the eyes of kings and queens, soldiers and criminals, Romans and royalists, and challenge friends and family to join you along the way. You will be able to watch videos of Queen Ethelfleet rallying her troops right on the spot you are standing, take photos of yourself as a Roman gladiator, and guide yourself around using the built-in GPS quest map. But Wall's Quest is more than just a guide, it's an adventure. You'll need to be observant, use your imagination, and be ready to take part in the quest challenges. You'll be rewarded with quest points, be able to unlock special guild shields, and the best questers will win special bonus games to play. This is the most enjoyable way to experience Chester using your phone. So what are you waiting for? Download the app for free, get on the walls and discover how history has become legend. Okay, so it's sickeningly dramatic and over the top. <laughs> Basically, the, the app is essentially um, uh, based around a circular tour. Um, oops. Oh, that's, that's the video, is it? Okay. So the app is essentially based around a circular tour of Chester's walls, um, and it contains a number of points of interest, um, at which at any one of which you can view an image, a reconstruction drawing, uh, you can watch a video, you can, um, a video reconstruction of a period of, of the past, uh, you can read captions, um, and if you want to, you can browse more deeply into, into the story. So on one level, it is like a sort of interactive guidebook, if you like. But if you choose to do the Wolf's Quest aspect of, of the app, uh, it brings another, another whole layer of interaction, a chance to carry out quests and challenges and to earn points and collect shields and rewards. Competing um, in quest challenges gains players points, which can be compared to other players on the scoreboard. And introducing the element of competition increases the chance of people going further and completing the two, and th two to three hour circuit of the walls. Now, that, that remains to be tested in evaluation, and I, I would like to tell you that it's all been evaluated, and it, it hasn't at this point. But, but you know, the intention is that that is one of the outcomes, that people will be encouraged to go further because of the competition element. And certainly from anecdotal evidence that we have, it, it does seem that people are driven to complete the challenges in games, and it, and it means that they spend longer on the walls. More points helps players gain higher status, and actually, the, the language that we use in the game when you attain a new status is based very much around the medieval world of Chester, and in particular, um, what, what were called guilds. I don't know whether you had guilds in medieval Sweden, but they were basically powerful groups of, of um, artisans and, um, and tradesmen and so on, and they basically ruled the city. Uh, and there were various uh, people, apprentice, journeyman, master, and there, there are others as well. So we, we've taken the language of Chester's medieval past and used it in the game as well. Um, completing multiple challenges uh, unlocks shields. Again, this, this refers back to that motivational technique of collecting. 
People collect to the shields as they go around. But one of, one of the sort of downsides of, of any technology, particularly screen-based technology, is uh, that it, it can encourage people to do this. OK. It, and um, so deliberately, with the app actually points people to things to look at on the walls, features to look for, views to look out for. It's, it's actually encouraging people not to spend all their time doing this, but to look out. So yes, we give them the interpretive message, and there are some funky features, but actually it's still fundamentally about interacting with the historic environment in this case. Um, but it also encourages people to interact with the fixed interpretation around the walls. So some of the questions within the app you can only answer by visiting a panel to find the answer, for example. So we're encouraging that interaction between the low-tech site-based interpretation and the thing that people are carrying around uh, in their hands. Um, another aspect, just briefly, there's a, a ne the next film. I don't know if we've included this one. Have we the binoculars one? So just moving aside from the app, um, this is another aspect of the technology that was employed in the project. This is a, a set of a view from uh, inside a set of virtual reality binoculars, which are located next to the, the race course in Chester. Uh, and the idea of these is that you pay money to, to, to use them, um, and that you then get snapshots through history of what the race course once looked like, accord, according to the archaeological evidence. Um, and this, so you've got this sort of mixture of CG, and you can see these little animated elements. These, are, these were filmed separately, actually, as people um, performing different tasks. And it just takes you through different snapshots of time. And there's an audio track as well, uh, which, which has some sound effects and creates this sort of atmospheric soundscape. So this, we didn't just rely on the app. There was this, this other sort of wow factor. Um, and we had to get the, the actual unit from New Zealand. It was the only place that um, actually made this sort of set of binoculars. So if you, if you want to corner the market in virtual reality binoculars, Sweden, then there's an opportunity, because it'd be easier to bring one in from Sweden than it would be from, from New Zealand, which did cause a few headaches, uh, I, can, I can tell you. So, as I said, we don't have any formal evaluation on, on how the Walls Quest app has performed so far, but it is something that's being pursued through the Portico project. And I can certainly feed back through um, Pear or Christina um, you know, any results from that, if, if that's useful to people. Um, however, should we, should we stop that one? Thank you, Victor. <coughs> I'm just going to skip through a few of these, that's the video. So whilst we don't have a valuation for um, the Walls Quest app, uh, another app that we've produced, which is now finally closer to your subject of interest, which is, is nature uh, interpretation, uh, we produced as part of a pilot project, um, again, another app, uh, with a much simpler gaming mechanic at its heart. It's, it's still about point scoring, but it's about spotting things and visiting places uh, and ticking them off your list as you go, and you get points, and you can compete against your peer group in your family, maybe up to five players. Um, and this was uh, introduced by the um, RSPB, which is a major uh, bird conservation charity, uh, and local partners on the edge of London in a place called Rain and Marshes. Um, and as part of this project, they carried out an evaluation. And these are just some of the headline figures. Again, if, if people are interested in the more detailed report, I'm happy to share. But 75% said they'd learnt very much about the local area and the wildlife. 56% said the app had enhanced their experience of visiting. 83% said they liked the game element. And 100% said they'd recommend the app to a friend. So on the strength of the, of the evaluation, they're now, we're in the process of rolling this out on a larger scale um, at Rain and Marshes uh, because they were so pleased with the way that the evaluation um, has sort of worked. So I'd, I'd just like to sort of, so that's apps to, to a degree, and there's lots more that people will be saying about apps, I'm sure. Um, but having talked about apps, I'd just like to have a change of tack now. If I've, I've, how am I doing for time? We're doing OK. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about an innovative project um, which uses the power of Twitter 
to create an interpretive experience. And this is part of, um, uh, of an innovation award. Again, this is a pilot project, and uh, it's looking to be rolled out pending some funding for the client at um, uh, the Yorkshire Museum in the city of York, which is another of our uh, touristy, um, quaint old cities in the north of England. It's centred on um, this person here, who's been nicknamed the Ivory Bangle Lady, and she was a Roman citizen uh, about 1,600 years uh, ago. Um, and archaeological research has revealed an awful lot about her life. Uh, she is, there's almost nothing that archaeologists don't know about this, this woman. And so they've been able to reconstruct her whole life. Uh, the challenge of the project was really to interpret her remains in a new and exciting way that would engage uh, perhaps new audiences, younger people in particular. Um, and so uh, I just want to put a film. I do apologise. Some of it's quite fast talking. You might not catch all of it, but it gives you a sense of what it was about. So if you can bear with it, uh, that would be great. It's better than hearing me drone on that. Really. We're at the Yorkshire Museum today doing the pilot of the Ivory Bangle Lady and we're tweeting the dead. Young children especially are really loving it, really engaging with it. And being here today and being able to see that reaction firsthand not only gives us the great feedback from things we need to tweet now, but actually gives us the, uh, the justification of what we've actually done. To be able to have that academic research, something that's really you know, solid and grounded and is, is respected, um, and then be able to turn that into something that that is really exciting and really whizzy and really fantastic is, is how you appeal to everybody. And I think that's why it's you know, such a great project for us. The Ivory Bangle Lady was discovered around 1901 and she's got some real big impact on the stories around York or have you. So what we started to do was take those stories, see how we could uh, move them around the museum, the different parts, and then we took it on such a thing, well, this almost becomes a trail. There are various parts of the museum which talk about different parts of Roman York, and we want to move people through with her story. So the idea of a trail came out, and then quite soon after that we wanted to bring the technology in, and we've ended up with what is the Ivory Bangle Lady Twitter trail. So I looked at the bones as a, as a biological anthropologist, I re-examined them, and also just looked at them for the first time, in some cases some ones that have been forgotten in the back of the museum. So it's been really lovely that they've actually embraced the um, Bangle Lady, they've really got into the story, they really are truly interested in her, in her remains and what they can tell, her age, her sex, her ancestry, and also her artefacts and what that means. And it's been quite interesting, some of the feedback we've been getting of how they would be buried with certain things and what they would choose one gentleman thought he'd be buried with the Beatles' Sgt Pepper album. That was really interesting. And another lady said she'd take her diamonds with her to the grave and not leave them to her children because she, were, she wanted them. So it's a way of making them think about things they might be buried with and how people would see them in the future if they were excavated with these different items of their personal possessions with them. So that's been really good to have this interaction and getting them to see what it means to excavate some remains and, and how we work really and how we interpret the things that they're found with. When we last met, I told you that I came from Rome. But how can you know so much about me? After all, I lived and died 1600 years ago. So they meet the Ivory Bangle lady to start with and she gives them the description of her life. And so they listen to her, but they get a clue. And then they can tweak that clue, and they can text that clue. And what that does, it unlocks the next one. And suddenly, as soon as they tweet it, she appears fully projected on the wall next to them and tells them the next part of her story. So she's like the ghost coming through the museum. A 1,600-year-old lady guides you through the museum. To unlock the next location in the train, you need to tweet or text the last Latin word in the inscription. Good luck. I think as a museum we're, we're always really looking for different ways and new ways, exciting ways to, to inspire people and, and enthuse them with our objects. So being able to work digitally with something that's new and will engage visitors in a completely different way is really exciting um, and it, it enables us to kind of add lots of layers to the way we interpret our objects. So you don't just come to a museum and read a label and look at an object behind a case. Um, with, with this project you actually get to meet somebody, um, you know, Bangal Lady's brought back to life, the flesh is put back on her bones and 
any visitor, be it a child, a mum and dad, a, a grown up or an academic, I think can learn a lot and be really inspired by that. And that's why this is a fantastic project for us. Did that come across okay? Did you get the idea of that? Um, yeah, I don't want to spend too long. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm um, running a little bit short. One of the, the things that was very effective, actually, was this catchy, I, this catchy, thought-provoking, maybe even slightly provocative um, phrase, I tweet dead people. And that was one of the things that came across as being, as grabbing people's attention, you know. Um, and we're looking at the moment, we're in discussion with a number of museums to look at this brand and whether this brand could, could work in other places. Um, but you, I can imagine, you know, I tweet using the, the bird reference, they must have plenty of inspirational, but you know, to create a, t a Twitter trail. The, the other thing that we um, made sure was that people could also do this using texting, because not everyone has a Twitter account. I don't, I hate Twitter personally, but <laughs> it's another thing to worry about. Um, but uh, it was very successful. Um, so you know, watch this space to see this being rolled out um, more, more widely. Um, so really, here's a couple of just bits of anecdotal feedback. They, the, the children love the technology. It really engaged them. They would have improved the trail by making it longer. We only had time to make a short trail. Uh, I thought it was a really cool way to make an exhibit interesting and to get the major points across really clearly. I really enjoyed it. So it was very successful. Um, I'm just going to very, very quickly touch on this, because there's, there's a couple of points which I, I, I want to bring out from this. This was another project on the same um, innovation uh, award program called Ghosts in the Garden. Now, the idea behind this was to use technology, but to use it very discreetly. Um, and so it was basically to explore a Victorian park in the middle of Bristol. And inside this rather strange looking contraption, which people carried around with them, is a, a smartphone. And it's linked to a, an audio speaker. And it's got GPS trigger points um, programmed into it, so that as you explore using the map, explore the garden, you're taken on an adventure. Um, it's actually a story, a bit like those storybooks that were very popular in the 80s. I don't know whether they were popular here, but you'd read and then you'd have a choice uh, and you could choose to go to page yeah. 25. And, you, and depending on the circumstances or the people that you spoke to, you'd end up in a different place. So you could actually use the book several times and, and take different choices and see different endings. And they took that approach with this. Um, but I, the reason I like this is because however laudable our, our, our um, interpretation, there is a danger of what you might call screen fatigue, as in getting tired with seeing screens all the time. And, and I can attest to this because I have three children. And it's one of the biggest battles in our house to, uh, to get our children off screens. So I think whilst, of course, technology is wonderful and screen-based technology is very powerful, it's just, a, again, another little thought that actually sometimes it can be distracting. Um, and actually also, technology like this, as I sort of alluded to earlier, can be isolating, the, the screen down, headphones on. Um, so, you know, this was very much about in encouraging interaction because it was audible to the group walking around and they could all join in the experience. And I think it's just very important to emphasize that, interac that interactive element to it. So I just wanted to sort of flag that one up as a, uh, an important project that I thought was interesting. And I just love the box. It was so beautifully designed to look like some Victorian contraption. Um, this is a visitor center in which we were involved um, in the North York Moors National Park. Now, I just wanted to show a few pictures of this because, again, this is a, an example of how we've integrated technology um, in a very sort of intuitive and simple way. Um, the challenge here was to interpret the geological uh, landscape and social history of this part of the, of the North York Moors called Sutton Bank. And this brand new visitor center is located in a, in a viewpoint that overlooks this feature. Um, so, you know, right from the, the outset when we were designing it, we came up with the idea of um, contour lines on a map that represent the landscape. And then we, then we thought actually about um, how could we weave in uh, a, an engaging technology that means that we don't have to have lots of graphic panels with lots of text on. Uh, people here have got very limited duration. They're passing through. 
we wanted something that really grabbed their attention. So we came up with the, the idea of using RFID. Now, do people know RFID? 10 minutes. Uh, radio frequency identification. Um, it's actually very, very widespread and pervasive. Uh, I suspect IKEA use RFID all across their stores to track things coming in and out. It's basically a way of giving uh, something a unique uh, identification so that when it comes close to a, a receiver, it recognises that tag and it triggers an action. It's very simple. All we're doing really is taking objects like this skull, uh, and in this case, an archaeologist's trowel, which has been tagged. And when you bring it close to the receiver, it triggers some content on the screen. And it's quite amazing just to watch just that simple mechanic of having to, of not knowing what's going to happen but taking an object physically and putting it down and then something happens. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. And we've used that quite a few times, actually. Um, so, and, and, the, and the objects naturally arouse curiosity. What's that? What story? You know, and people want to do it. But we haven't forgotten the low tech as well. So on the same podium, so podium structures, you've got the objects, the screens, and then you've got low tech you know, things like turn the wheel and brass rubbings and all the things that you know, you probably know about. Um, just briefly, another project, very different subject, but we've again used RFID effectively. This is um, a historic copper mine in um, Anglesey, which is in the northwest of Wales. Uh, it's an amazing place. If you ever get to come to the United Kingdom, it's an astonishing place to visit. Um, but here we, the research showed showed us that there were lots of characters, lots of people involved in the historic business of mining and processing copper. Uh, and we wanted to give people a sort of personal journey around the, the exhibition so they could choose which character they wanted to, to lead off with and they could hear their story as they go through the exhibition. But they could also hear other people's stories as well. But it, the idea was that it just gave you a little individual slant, a little individual take on uh, on the stories to be told here. And again, it was mixed with graphics and objects and so on as part of a, a big display. These fun, fun sort of features where children can go in and pop their head through and colouring in sheets. And, you know, so we're mixing, mixing the media together. And touch table as well, which we used very successfully, particularly because we wanted to show the extent of this copper mine on an aerial uh, photograph and then allow people to trigger um, uh, content that tells them about the underground experience and different things about copper ore and, and the historic workings and so on. So just almost to finish, near field communication. Now this, this is something else which is very akin to RFID and I'm going to take my life in my hands now by just showing you uh, how simple uh, and wonderful this is. I think the idea is the allure of near field communication is its simplicity. And I'm about to prove it horribly wrong <laughs> by doing a demonstration. So here on my, um, on my tablet, I, I have programmed um, with my tablet, very simply, I've programmed this chip, which is a near-field communication chip, to perform a task. I'll see if this will work. I just place it at the back. OK. And what it's done is triggered, in this case, a video about Dartmoor. OK. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but you can... So the, the point is, with these, these little devices, which don't require any power, they can be placed outside on trails, and if you've got wireless access in particular, uh, they can trigger all sorts of content. So just with a simple post, and uh, this mounted behind a graphic, for example, uh, you can just tap your device against it, and you've got a video. You don't need to put panels everywhere. You can... User. They're very powerful, but I'm mean, happy to talk to people more about that later on. I've, I've uh, got the, but this is a, an emerging technology um, which is being more widely adopted. Unfortunately, Apple haven't adopted it yet, but Google have. Um, you, where you might have seen this already is contactless payment points. So where you just tap your uh, phone and you pay for a service. Um, or the, in London, we have the Oyster card you have something similar in Copenhagen, uh, well, in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, I, you know, where people come off the train and they scan something, where they just, they just tap a card. So it's, it's that sort of technology. So just want to finish then by 
returning to this important equation, message plus media plus motivation equals meaning. And I think that's it.